Welcome to the Space Dreamers Podcast, a Sumadre production. Welcome to the Space Dreamers Podcast. This is an exceptionally special episode. Uh, my guest today is, I'm going to christen you, the mother of all sci-fi lovers. Okay. So, yeah. So, because technically, <laughs> well, because you don't, you're not really like, you don't love sci-fi, but you're, you're, my, you're my mother and you're Amy's mother and Heather's mother. So you're the, the mother of those sci-fi lovers. So anyway, that probably doesn't make any sense. But anyway, we are here to discuss sci-fi novel uh, Dolphin Island by Arthur C. Clarke, which is, if you're familiar with Arthur C. Clarke, I'm sure you know that it is a very weird little book. Um, I do not love it. I never thought that I would love it when I first became aware of it. I never imagined that it would be good. Or that I would enjoy it, and I read it. I don't even know a few years ago, and I was like, "Well, since at some point in my life I want to read every Arthur C. Clarke novel, I guess I'm glad that I read that." But the thing about it is that it's very much, it's very clear that it's for kids, where Arthur C. Clarke does not normally do that. Normally, his novels are for adults. Um, but is this he, the only one that he wrote that could be considered for young adults? Yes. Um, there's nothing. Clark doesn't ever do anything that's like. R rated or even PG thirteen rated, really. Um, but this is clearly written for a child audience. And to your point, um, someone in the Arthur C. Clarke Facebook group mentioned that Clark did this because it was popular at the time, where sci fi writers were doing this at the time. They realized the market for younger people, and it's it was basically just a way to like have more readers. Um, and I just think that Clark. And fans and people in general realize that it's not what anyone wants from him. Um, I could be totally wrong. I really don't know. But let's get into it. First. um, Wait, I have a question. Yes. So has he ever written anything else to do with like animals? Yes. Um, Yes. So he has, there's three novels that he's ever written that are about the ocean. This is one of them. There's another one about raising the Titanic, which is not about animals. But the other one is about whales. Uh, it's called The Deep Range. And that's the only one that's about animals. I mean, most of his stories take place, like, on other planets. Um, there is one novel. <laughs> you probably won't find this interesting. But there is one novel toward the end where I remember this takes place on an alien planet. And they discover that there are sentient, intelligent lobsters. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So those are not really animals, but or they're like crustaceans, whatever. Yeah. Um. So first, wait, this is going to be a weird episode. First, I want to tell a story that this book reminded me of. So, mother, have you ever been to a reef? Have you ever seen a reef or been to one? No. Okay. So when I was 18 years old, I went to the Cayman Islands, as you may remember. Mm-hmm. And the Cayman, the the big island is called Grand Cayman. And it's basically, if you imagine a rectangle, and then there's a big uh, semicircle kind of taken out of one side, and that's like a bay. Mm-hmm. And so it's very shallow. And then the basically the the area where the bay becomes open ocean is like a reef. And so we went out in the middle of this bay, and you like snorkel, and then you hang out with some uh, stingrays, and like I got that touch stingrays and whatever but then they bring you to the edge of the of the like the threshold between bay and open ocean and i was snorkeling out there and i was looking down and and to your left it's like white sand illuminated by the sun because the water is like 15 feet deep and then there's this all this coral and stuff and then it's black open ocean and it was horrifying for me to be there like swimming and I think I was by myself like the people I was with were like on the boat or whatever and when I looked to the right I was like I don't want to be here anymore well that uh, almost exact same thing happens in this book right like one of the first times that he goes 
that Johnny goes out and he sees the dark, the dark deep ocean. Right. That's yeah. probably the scene that reminded me of it. Um, that was scary. I agree. Yeah. Uh, the ocean is scary to me, like, regardless. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it's like so big and you can't see what's in it. Right. So it's terrifying. I want to do one more. I want to do one more thing as an opening because I'm curious because you have a unique perspective on this podcast. Okay. Do you remember the year 1969? I guess. You were pretty young, right? 14. Okay. Do you remember the moon landing? Vaguely. Do you remember anything about it? Like, can you just give me any little, like, detail or... I don't remember watching it on TV or anything like that, so I probably heard them talk about it on on the news or something. And most people were watching though, right? I don't remember. Oh, okay. And um was that where the guy said one step for man? But yeah, I yeah. remember that. But if you weren't watching, what do you remember? Was it like on the radio the next day or something? Yeah, probably. Was it a big deal at the time? The way people make it a big deal now. Um, I don't. I don't remember. I guess okay. I don't remember. That's all right. Do you remember like anything? Tell me any story that like with space flight that you remember in history because the the shuttle program was around at its it's at its peak before I was born. So, I mean, you were watching when the Challenger happened, right? Mm-hmm. What was that like? It was really scary. Okay. I've heard you tell a story about this, so you should tell it now. What story? About Weren't watching you watching TV? it with people? Or do, I remember you having to explain it to Heather and Amy, right? Yeah. So we were watching TV. We were watching Lassie. Okay. You know, Lassie about the, the dog. dog. Yeah. yeah. And I explain that because when I tell kids like at work about Lassie, they don't know who Lassie is. So I, anyway, um, we were watching Lassie and it was really sad. And when we got to the end of the movie, I remember being like, oh, that's right. It's the day the challenge is going up with the teacher from Concord. So I switched the channel to that and... Oh, this, um, real quick interjection. This is, the fact that you said Concord, if you're listening to this and you don't know, this podcast is based in New Hampshire. Concord is the capital of New Hampshire. Right. Where the teacher, the first teacher in space was from Concord. Yeah. And I remember switching there, switching the channel and seeing um, all the kids like in the cafeteria at Concord High School and... You know, her parent, uh, the teacher in space's parents being, you know, down there to watch. And and then they, you know, it, it I turned to it right when it took off, you know, right when it launched. And, um, you know, I remember it going up and me thinking, wow, this is crazy. And you couldn't pay me enough to be on that spaceship. And then, you know, it got pretty high before it exploded. And then it was just like, what the hell just happened? Like, was that supposed to happen? And like, nobody knew right away. Right. I mean, everyone was just like, what? Right. Just happened. And then I remember the newscasters or whatever they, you know, news people saying, um, you know, something about there being a problem. And I was like, oh my God, like those people all just blew up. Mm -hmm. And then just because I'm such a visual person and I see everything in my mind, even if I don't actually see it, I was literally imagining like body parts, like flying around in the sky and Mm -hmm. where were they going to land? Because it wasn't even that far up. But I think it landed in the ocean or something. Yeah, yeah. And I think they actually did recover some Body body parts. Yeah. And, but anyway, I remember like just imagining that it was horrifying. 
Yeah. And I'm it was sure. really, really sad. Right. Yeah. Um, if you haven't checked out, Netflix has a pretty good um, documentary, like a four part miniseries about the Challenger that's pretty interesting. It and is, yeah. For me, the most interesting part about it is. It, I just think it's important to point out just that that was the shuttle program just wasn't going to work out. Um, right. It's just an interesting thing. And I, and I hate to go back to tragedy, but do you remember the Columbia in 2001? I Is believe the one with the fire or something. It was, it broke up upon reentry over Texas. Oh, I, I vaguely, I remember, I remember that one, but I didn't really know. I didn't understand it because I was very young. I mean, it's too bad that I keep asking you about tragedy, you know, but it's like. Well, the thing is, I have really so little interest in right. space that probably the only thing that would have made an impression on me would be something bad happening. Right. And I was going to say that that's, I would, I would argue the majority of this country. Yeah. Most people don't but, care about anything until something like shocking happens. Yeah, but I do remember like over the years hearing like, you know, that that a, a rocket or spaceship, whatever you call them, was going to take off and, you know, they would just mention it as part of the news. Right. And maybe it would be, I remember a few times the weather was bad so they'd have to um, like reschedule. And right. I, so I remember hearing it, but I had no just no interest. The other thing is when I was like a kid... There was no, um, like, you know, you can be whatever you want when you grow up, and girls can be anything boys can be. But then when I got a little older, and that's they started saying stuff like that, then I remember the big thing with women was, you can even be an astronaut. And I remember thinking, no, thank you. <laughs> it, no. There was like an astronaut Barbie. Wow. And I just was like, no. It's this. There are some things I'd like to be that men are typically that, but an astronaut would not be one of them. Okay. Do you think that's a bad message to send? What is? To encourage women to be astronauts? No. Okay. Just not me. Right, right. <laughs> um, I mean, I think if you're scientific minded and that that's probably a great right. thing to strive for and it's interesting and everything. I will say though, Back to the moon landing, you know that movie, Man in the Moon, I think it's called? With uh, Aragorn, the guy from Lord of the Rings? I don't know who that is. Um, Viggo? Yeah, Viggo Mortensen? Yes. I remember that movie really well, and that's all about, <laughs> it takes place around the, I remember it that. takes place at the time? Yes. Okay. And I remember that movie more than I remember when it actually happened. How much of the movie is about the moon landing? Like it's all takes place like right at that time. Literally that that day, I mean. I'm going to have to watch it for this podcast because that sounds interesting. Like I, I can it's watch. It's a love story. Right. But, but it's still really good. But at the same time, like I could, you can talk about all kinds of like space battle movies yeah. all day. They're all the same. You know what I mean? So it'd be, I would be curious to. Yeah. And I just, I think it's interesting that I, you know, I saw that as an adult and that I remember more about the moon landing from that. Oh. than the actual moon landing I that I was alive for. Well, I'll give you a pass because you were only 14. What do you mean only 14? Do your parents, did your parents watch it? Like, do you even remember that? I don't remember discussion about it or anything. Okay. That's all right. Uh, um, I remember okay. like the first time the Beatles was, were on Ed Sullivan. Like I could talk about that. And I okay. Could, I could talk about when um, President Kennedy died and his funeral. I mean, I, I do remember some things. Yeah, yeah. Wait, so... But I don't remember that. Okay, wait. I was going to ask another question. Oh, yeah. 2001 A Space Odyssey. Do you remember when that came out? In the, oh, yeah, that was around the same time. Duh. That was the year before. <laughs> Have you ever seen 2001 A Space Odyssey? I think... I think I tried to watch it once or something, but it was boring yeah i tried to watch it when i was like in high school i think and i i didn't know what was going on yeah. i turned it off yeah i think i turned it off too and that and i don't normally like maybe now i'll fall asleep in a movie but 
I used to watch a movie no matter how bad it was, beginning to end. Right. When did that come out? 1968. Oh. So, so before the moon landing. So it would have been like in the theaters? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't can't remember. imagine you saw that at 13, you know? No, I was watching like um, Last when year. we owned Julia. Oh. And, yeah. All right. All right. So let's uh, let's get into this book now. Uh, so Arthur C. Clarke's Dolphin Island was released in the year of 19... Uh-oh. I'm pretty sure 1963. I have to look this up now. I looked. Quick. I thought it was 64. 64. Okay, let's check. But I, don't, I have a... Oh, 63. You're right. Okay. Why did I think 64? So Dolphin Island was released in 1963, and as I said, it is uh, considered like a young adult book. I would consider it a young adult book. Um, at the time, the term young adult didn't exist. The term juvenile existed. But like these days, we have children's books, children's intermediate young adult, and then just regular fiction. So I think back in the day, it was just like, if it was for kids, it was just juvenile. Like 15 and lower. Anyway. um, Once you were like 13 or 14, if you were a good reader, which I was, you read adult books. Okay. When did you read The Catcher in the Rye for the first time? Do you remember? Oh, God, I've read that book so many times. Probably like 13. Nice. All right. Wait, okay. So um one moment. Okay. So let's get into like the plot of Dolphin Island. Well, first of all, did you enjoy this novel? No. Okay. Me either. I think but I think you probably had different expectations than I did about it. I and I think I already mentioned to you that I I don't like books, and I never did, about boys. Okay. Like, I would have liked this a lot better if the main character had been a girl. And I don't know why. Maybe I can just, like, identify with a... You mean in general or in no, when young I was, adult? In young adult. Okay. When I was a kid, I never wanted to read books. And, and not like Catcher in the Rye, because he's like a right, right. teenager. But when I was younger, I didn't like reading books. Like, I liked Nancy Drew, but I didn't like the Hardy Boys. Okay. Because I didn't like books about boys. Well, that kind of makes sense. Um, Remember the first books that I ever read? The Roland Roland Smith books? Roland Smith? Yeah. I mean, that was about a boy who went on adventures exploring things that I was interested at the time. So you're, right. you're just going to be attracted to what you're into. You know what I mean? And exactly. I think when you're a kid, you can't really separate boy and girl mm-hmm. uh, motivations. And like, so, and those books were even kind of sci-fi, which is kind of interesting. The first books I ever read were like kind of sci-fi. Uh, yeah. I've, I thought of him when I was reading this a few times, actually. Really? Yeah. And those books are children intermediate. Yeah. Which is weird. They're not young adult. Right. Um. <clears throat> so, Okay. Also, you don't like sci-fi, so I should also probably explain why you're the why you're the guest. I just wanted to get you on the show for at least one episode, and even though I I knew you wouldn't like this novel, and I know that I don't think it's a particularly good novel, I figured it was the only one that you would be willing to you know like really read and and be able to talk about. I feel like, and it's not nothing against you, but like if it was a hard sci-fi like about space travel, I feel like you like you don't care enough to even. You know what I mean? Which mm-hmm. is... No, it was a good it was a good choice for me. And it and you know, I don't want to I don't want people listening to this to think I like never read cuz I yeah. read a lot. No, I know. So for me to make space in my reading agenda for a book I don't care about, I'd rather have it be a short. Yeah, that's the thing. Book this yeah. it's not real exactly. technical. Yeah, I read this book and like I don't like this book. It took me like 2 days to read and it's it's extremely short, too. It's the shortest book so far that we've done. Um, so let's get into the plot. Okay. Before we get into the plot, we have to get into an advertisement for something from the plot. Professor Kazan has finally debuted his magnum opus, The History of the Sea, 
written with the help of his dolphin colleagues. The professor long ago proved that dolphins are not merely intelligent, but equally as smart, if not smarter, than we humans. With no written language, dolphin culture has been passed down the generations by finned storytellers alone. Well, not anymore. Human history is long and complicated, but it simply cannot match the scope and scale of the history of the people of the sea. Learn all about the social hierarchy of ocean mammals dating back to three million years. This book was written by 50 people, and only one of them has fingers. What I like the most about this book is the beginning before he gets to the island. I liked that part, too. Nice. Well, for one thing, it didn't tell you exactly what was going on. Mm -hmm. And at first I was like, oh, man, like, what, what the heck is that thing that, you know, ends up stopping outside his house and but i was i was able to figure it out so that was good okay and i think in maybe some of the other ones if they describe something i wouldn't know what the heck they were talking about so i liked that it was easy to i I figured it out and it was that part was interesting right so in the in the adult clark novels he would have he would he would have over explained he would have explained everything about how that thing works oh and he would and it wouldn't be like in that kid voice that this novel is told in. Um, so, and do you notice too how he, it's pretty much a fairy tale because he does, his parents are dead and he lives with his aunt who doesn't like him and he doesn't get along with his cousins who he lives with. So it's just, it's just so classic. It's like, there's nothing here for me. Mm-hmm. It kind of reminded me of Harry Potter. Doesn't that happen to him? Yeah. Yes, actually. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I know that it's not at all like Harry Potter, but right. No, but it's made just, me think of that. It's standard like fairy tale stuff. You yeah. live with not your parents, and they don't they they give you a shitty life, and you want to escape. Right. So, little Johnny, his name is, he's like fourteen or something. He hears a boom or something. Here's a crash in mm-hmm. his bed, and he lives in Arizona. I know that, and he goes out, and he discovers a hover ship. So then you realize that this book is like in the future. Right. Which, yeah. So it's this giant, giant hover ship, um, which, and like hover ships never come up in Clark novels. It's always like spaceships. And you're, anyway, so he's got this big ass hover ship, and Johnny, it's clearly broken down, right? Because it like turns off and it rests yeah, it's on it. It's broken. Yeah. 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 So then he finds a ladder and starts climbing it, and then the thing turns on which it's like a rush of air below him. So he knows that if he gets off, he's going to get like hurt. Right. So his only option is to find, go climb up the ladder, find a door and enter go this in. hover ship. Yeah. Um, so on the one hand you think, Oh, that's bad. Like to get stuck in there. But on the other hand, it's just so perfect because he hates his life. Right. So he's getting whisked away by this futuristic hover ship thing. And like, what did you think of the hover ship? Was that inter- interesting to you? It's like a made-up futuristic te- technology. Yeah, it was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. It didn't I, I? I did. Like I tried again. I tried to picture it in my mind, and I don't know. I almost like pictured like a blimp or something. Really? Yeah, but but so I just made it up in my mind, and what the inside looked like. But I wondered what the landscape looked like. Did, was it just like now, or did something? happen or i don't know were, were they flying over like highways with i imagine like minivans on them or i imagine desert i think he mentions desert Does but he? at the same time i think he also mentions um that there are lanes designated for these hover ships yeah so i don't think there's any other traffic where it is but but I, I also i had trouble i had to make stuff up in my head because of how poorly described it is and was this like a? I think of hover as being close to the ground. So was it was it close to the ground? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, so they had to avoid like cities and mountains and, or did they go up over them? I don't know. I don't know. Again, nothing is explained. Nothing right. is nothing is expanded upon in this novel. Whereas right. most Clark novels, all that would be explained, and hmm. it would all be super fascinating. Um, so. So then, little Johnny. So then, like, the the whole beginning is about, like, do I have enough food to be able to survive on this hover ship? Like, where am I going? You know? Um, like, how am I going to avoid detection? I liked that when he was, like, 
like looking around the ship and then he found and he saw the people and and um I kind of liked that and I was like oh they're gonna they're gonna find him and take him under their wing so I was kind of surprised when yeah something bad happened <laughs> exactly yeah that's the thing so there's a there's a good scene I think where he is kind of hiding but behind some machinery and there's two people discussing like they're wearing hard hats and they have like clipboards and they're talking about the stuff and they they he says that they appear to be like angry like yeah. all riled up agitated yeah so i mean that's interesting again in another kind of clark novel you'd hear exactly what they talked about and exactly what they were coming up with to solve the problem but it's not that so i thought that part was cool um and then and then i don't know how we learn this but then you find out that it's going over the pacific ocean right so it's probably going to australia Right. And it crashes. Which that whole scene, again, it's pretty good. It's kind of pretty exciting. You know? And then you realize that then, like, the issue is no one knows he's on the ship. Yeah. That really sucks. That's a yeah. that's a lesson for a stowaway. Right. Make sure they know you're there. Yeah. So the ship sinks. And so then the conflict is, well, no one's going to come looking for me because no one knew I was on that ship and then you find out later that their only lifeboat was filled up with everyone including the cat that lived on the hover ship so they're like there no one was ever going to come looking for you i wonder how much of the food he ate though did they like yeah (laughs) hopefully they got where they were going before exactly yeah because the kid yeah that's one of his issues is like i might starve as a stowaway so then he goes and he finds the lifeboat and he takes some of the surviving food right whatever um, so then, okay, this part, I actually did, I really like this description, um, uh, yes, page 19, I love this description, he says, They were playing like children among the wreckage of the Santa Ana, butting at the floating debris with their streamlined snouts, making the strangest whistling and creaking noises as they did so. A few yards away, one had reared its head completely out of the water and was balancing a plank on its nose, like a trained animal in a circus act. It seemed to be saying to its companions, Look at me! See how clever I am! The strange, unhuman, but intelligent head turned toward Johnny, and the dolphin dropped its plaything with an unmistakable gesture of surprise. It sank back into the water, squeaking with excitement, and a few seconds later, Johnny was surrounded by glistening, inquisitive faces. So I love the description, unmistakable gesture of surprise. Like, I just picture a dolphin, like, doing its thing, and then realizing there's a life form floating on the water, and it just, like, kind of shakes, the plank falls, and then all of a sudden it's like, it completely forgot that it was ever balancing a plank, and now it's just curious. I like that. I thought that was a good description. What do you think about that? What do you think about that scene? Um... I feel like the dolphins, if they're as smart as they say, would have already known he was there. So I thought it was a little tiny bit contrived. What do you mean, no, he was there? How would they know he was there? I don't know. Because he's floating. Smell he's, he's, him or... Yeah, what was he floating on? Some piece of wreckage from the hover ship. Yeah. So maybe the dolphins saw the people leave and the thing... You know? They thought they were all gone. Yeah, so then they were like, "Oh, now's our chance to go play with these objects." I don't know, but I, I just like that description. I think it, it gives like it, it gave me a very dis, like a very clear image of a dolphin balancing a piece of wood on its nose and noticing a human, and it's kind of funny when I picture it. So I dug it. Um, well, that's good. Well, what we're kind of skipping, I, I didn't say. Basically, what happens is. The, he's floating on a piece of uh, wreckage and dolphins appear and save his life. They push the piece of wreckage 100 miles west to an island called the story's name Dolphin Island. So then the kid 
realizes that this island is there, or pe- there are scientists there, pale skin people, remember? Because everyone who lives there is dark skin, so they call him like a pale skin or whatever. Mm-hmm. So there's white people there conducting experiments with dolphins. They're basically trying to teach the dolphins how to speak English, kind of, or they're trying to communicate with the dolphins. They're trying to learn the dolphins' language. Right. It's ridiculous. Like, I don't even, it's ridiculous. But that's what the book is about. You seem surprised, chuckled the doctor. Hadn't you heard the dolphins could speak? Johnny shook his head. Well, it's been known for a half century that they have an elaborate language of their own. We've been trying to learn it, and at the same time trying to teach them basic English. We've made a good deal of progress thanks to the techniques worked out by Professor Gazan. You'll meet him when he comes back from the mainland. He's very anxious to hear your story. They're trying to talk to dolphins, and they consider dolphins the people of the sea, which, I mean, these days, we, we agree, I think scientifically, it's understood that dolphins happen to be pretty intelligent. Right. So... And I think that they're different sounds do have meaning right i just don't know if they translate into english right which they probably don't right um so i mean that's what the book is about there's a professor character i guess one kind of interesting conflict is that once he gets there it's one of those things where when i was reading the book it's like i would give anything to be johnny i really would you know, to be in that situation, to, to give to, to be given like a first a first a front row seat to these things that like you clearly have to be involved to even witness. And the kid just shows up and gets introduced to all of it. And that would be cool. It's totally ridiculous. Yeah, if, it's it not be cool. real. Yeah. But um, basically, well, Johnny, what, what were you going to say? No, I was just going to say the whole idea of communicating with the dolphins didn't even sound that crazy to me i mean except that they wouldn't necessarily do what you told them to do but to study how they communicate with each other didn't didn't sound that crazy until they went to the until they went like one step further and and would you know trying to tell them what to do with the little wristwatch thing yeah um it's a weird concept. This book has weird con. This book has weird concepts. And someone did mention, I think, in the Facebook group, that it's weird that Clark wrote a f- kids' novel that's toys with the idea of committing genocide against killer whales. It's a little weird. Mm-hmm. And the very, the very central conflict or the central theme here is that dolphin. What, what, Humans want dolphins to help them fish. Isn't that kind of what they're trying to do? Yeah. And I, that didn't... It's just I, weird. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, and I mean, dolphins get like caught in fishing nets all the time and get Yeah, but I hurt. think I think that the idea would be that if you could communicate with them, you could be like, hey, listen, this is how this net works. If you help us get... Don't get tangled. If you help us, we'll give you some of the catch. Yeah. I think that's the idea. I, I mean guess. that's to me this book is more fantasy than sci fi. It's yeah. it's Well so when ridiculous. they jumping more to the end, which I don't know if you That's fine do that, but um when they start hypothesizing that dolphins are like talking about things that happened thousands of years ago, like passing yeah. down stories, I was like, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. Yeah. Well see this is so the way sci fi sci fi is Science fiction can can give you the most ridiculous concept ever, but if you if you build up to it properly, then it'll work. This novel doesn't do that. It, I get it. They're saying that do, they're basically saying that dolphins are kind of like where we were before we started writing. Right. So if that's true, then yeah, they probably have an oral history. But you didn't set that up enough for me to believe right. that if that's true, doesn't make sense in my mind. So then the, them telling the history also doesn't. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. 
it's like it's it's a it's a rotten foundation, so nothing's gonna stand on it. Yeah. Um, but and and then I I also thought about um like the way they've taught um apes or chimps to communicate with sign language. Right. Right. So I'm assuming that chimps like talk to each other a certain way and people talk to each other a certain way but the only way they could end up communicating was a completely different language than what's typically spoken or commu- used for communication with either the chimps or the people mm-hmm. sign language so I don't think it's reasonable or even remotely probable that that this this was more like people the the scientist guys ended up figuring out what the dolphins meant in their language yeah and the dolphins knew what the people meant in their language in english yeah because I, they they it, had to because how would they get those concepts. I don't know. It just didn't seem like it seemed like they would have to have a, create a whole new language that didn't involve dolphin squeaks. Right. Or English. I agree. I mean, yeah. And I was probably getting too involved in it, but that was because. No, no, you, book wasn't that interesting to me so my mind was wandering well no no so that is the way you're supposed to think while you're reading science fiction it's just that there's nothing in this text to answer those questions mm-hmm. and it might and that's a problem mm-hmm. i'm not saying that's just the way the book is i'm saying the book shouldn't be like that it should be it should give you more so that you can intelligently consider these concepts right rather than just like the okay, like it's like a paragraph. They explain the professor just like listens to dolphins yeah. and is able to figure out like what the squeaks mean. So then it, it he like records the squeaks and plays them back, and that's how he communicates. It's just doesn't sound like it's possible. Yeah, to me. it doesn't at all. Um, and the other thing, I don't know if you're gonna get into this, is like the ethical human. Um, are animals being exploited for people like when they kept them in the little contained areas? Yeah. I mean, I kept thinking about like SeaWorld and... Yeah, I did too. Um, but it, but it's, I don't think, what I'm about to say I don't think is cool or makes very much sense. But mm-hmm. I, it's the answer to I think what you're saying is... He says that the idea, and as an idea, it's interesting, but in the book, it's not. He says that the dolphins brought him to the island Mm -hmm. because in a gesture of we helped you, now you have to help us. Remember? But we're still in the dark about their motives, said Dr. Keith. If wild dolphins that have never had any direct contact with men go to all this trouble, it suggests they want something from us and want it badly. Perhaps rescuing? Johnny meant something like, we've helped you, now help us. It's a plausible theory, agreed Professor Kazan, but we won't find the answer by talking. There's only one way to discover what Johnny's friends were driving at, and that's to ask them. So I think it's mutual between a human and dolphin. And they also talk about how even though it's just one island studying a finite amount of dolphins, dolphins get out and talk to each other. Right. So every, like the idea is that like there's millions of dolphins all over the oceans that know about Dolphin Island and know that there are humans who could potentially help them in their battle against killer whales. That sounds dumb even saying it. Mm -hmm. so the idea then so then the idea it's so ridiculous that the idea is that humans are going to aid dolphins in an interspecies war (laughs) this is this is fantasy 
territory. We're in here. Um, so the, the killer whales are apparently the dolphin's enemy, both for food and because killer whales sometimes eat dolphins. Right. So I guess the idea, and then remember at the end when they said they were going to build like a dividing line between the oceans where killer whales would live in one area yeah. and dolphins live in another? It's like, dude, what are you playing, God? Like, what are you doing? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. When I, I read that and I, st- and yeah, that was towards the end because I remember thinking, now how would this work? Wait a minute. It's not going to work. It wouldn't work. No. So, it's thinking like the line and then it like hits another island and they have to go around it. And Well, no. So in that case, it would, it would be, um, this, it, this is interesting too, because this is all explored in the deep range, which is a phenomenal novel. It takes place in the ocean. It's the best one that I've read so far in this. So it's not the ocean that's ruining Clark. It's whatever he tried to do in this novel. Um, it, it would be, and this probably won't make sense to you, but it's all explained in the book. It would be a, a net made out of sound. So because these two animals operate entire, almost entirely when it's dark on the sonar, mm-hmm. you, can, you can beam signals to them that, that say, don't go over there. Hmm. That's, that's a, a lot of what the deep range is about. But it's explained so much better in that, in that novel. Um, what did you think about... <laughs> this book is so stupid. What did you think about the UFO? The aliens? <laughs> I just... To be honest, I just kind of like, not skipped over it. But you just blacked like, out while you're reading yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's in there yeah, just because it's Clark. And don't they say <laughs> something like, isn't it like, um, so aliens must have landed here at some point. Or yeah. Something, and I'm like, what? Has yeah. this got to do with anything? I know. So the idea, the idea is that dolphins have an oral history of, of the sea. You know what I mean? Like we have a history of the world, probably meaning, you know, the world on land. Right. Dolphins have a history of the sea. The uh, aliens probably have a history of space. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, the... So they remember when they... Yeah, they have yeah. this this story that they've passed down generation, generation, generation of, and when they describe it, it's so clear that they're talking about an aliens landing on Earth. Right. Like before humans were here. Right. Or something. I don't know. Um, well, I kept thinking maybe they were going to have a history or, or remember when... Or, or like explain... When whatever happened in the world, the dinosaurs. That would have been cool. Yeah. You know, like, and I, even that I thought it was to me like aliens landed and wiped out all the dinosaurs, but the dolphins were safe in the sea or something. I don't know. Yeah. That would have been cool. Um, are you familiar with uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Probably, I haven't thought about it in a really long time. So. Okay. Well, that I read the first book um, in 2020, and it's one of those series where like everyone just loves it, and they don't shut up about it. It's like, just shut up. And then I read it, and I was like, oh, I get it. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. So the way that novel, well, I, plus it was like a radio thing. I don't know. I read the book. I read the book. The, the way the book opens is dolphins are aliens. And they're leaving Earth, <laughs> and they they say their catchphrase for leaving Earth is "so long" and "thanks for all the fish." <laughs> it's amazing. You know what? Something like that. I think when they talked about the aliens, I did think like maybe dolphins arrived, came here from another planet, but maybe that's maybe I was thinking of that book. I mean, it makes sense. Like if 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 there's a planet where the dominant species and the dominant thing is ocean and ocean animals and they gained the ability to leave their planet and they came to earth then they would probably stay in the ocean yeah and we could potentially be separated for a long time right i don't know but yeah you know i i just i agree part of the problem is like the if, if dolphins are so smart like they would find a way to like let us know, you mm-hmm. know, like they would do something that only an intelligent, self-aware entity could do. But they're just friendly, and they flip around and they jump around, and you mean in real life, not in this yeah, yeah. novel, yeah, yeah, in real life. Because even in here, they had like a sense of humor, and they could tell if they were yeah. joking, and yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, maybe we need to get a kid to read this. It's a really good idea. I don't know any kids. I used to know tons of them. 
Well, oh well. Um, Wait, let me try to think. You know what? Let, remind me after this is over because I can't think right now. And I might be able to think of a kid. Okay. Um, get to read this. Maybe some kid who already likes young adult novels. Because it's isn't this like this is young adult and like the world we live in now, young adult is like, young adult is um, Hunger Games. It's like literally kids murdering each other. <laughs> yeah. Get, gets turned into like a ridiculously successful film franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Let me see here. Oh, this I totally want to get into with you. The teaching computers. Professor Gazam was keen on education, and the island had 12 teachers, two human, 10 electronic. This was about the usual proportion, since the invention of teaching machines in the middle of the 20th century had at least put education on a scientific basis. All the machines were coupled to Oscar, the big computer which did the professor's translating, and could play championship chess on demand. Soon after Johnny's arrival, Oscar had given him a thorough quiz to discover his level of education then had prepared suitable instruction tapes and printed a training program for him. Now he spent at least three hours a day at the keyboard of a teaching machine, typing out his responses to the information and questions flashed on the screen. What's up with that? I don't know. You are a teacher. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know. I was like back in that. I think, you know what? I think that's actually where I looked to see when it was written. Written. Okay. Has this ever, like, working in that field, is that a thing, automation and teaching that people debate? I mean, like computers? I don't know. I didn't. So this so this is supposed to be in the future. Yeah. But it was written in the 60s. Yep. So. It, that's a, that is a thing that you have to tackle with Clark all the time. Yeah, it's, yeah. So I think he was just like, probably people, uh, kids aren't going to be learning traditionally, so maybe there'll be be machines that teach them. I don't. Okay. Do you think a machine could teach a kid? Do you think a machine could could replace a teacher? Honestly. Well, you mean like a computer? It's a computer machine? Yeah. Do you think an AI or like not a human? Oh, oh. Do you okay. think do you think a physical like human a being robot. in a room with kids? Well, now it's different from freaking COVID. But like, do you think that is necessary for teaching? For for you know, depends on the kid and the motivation. Probably depends on the teacher, right? Well, yeah. Because listen to this. This is what I'm getting to. All right. This is a quote from Arthur C. Clarke. It's one that I love. It's not one of his most famous, but I love it because he's a cheeky SOB. This is a quote from Clark. Any teacher who can be replaced by a machine should be. It kind of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Saying, hey, listen, the only reason you think a computer could replace a teacher is because you have shitty teachers. The best teacher is a human teacher, Mm -hmm. but those are hard to come by. Or maybe they're not hard to Good come Good ones by. are hard yeah, to come Yeah, that's by. my point. That's my point. Yeah. I'm not trying to talk shit about teachers, but yeah. like... Um, but I mean... See, I didn't dwell on that at all because I figured they're on an island. And so... There maybe wouldn't be a lot of... I mean, they had to like bring all those native people there to do all their jobs. Do they? They say that? I think so. Yeah, like they're from neighboring islands. Yeah. Okay. Or from Australia or something. Right, right. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I think it would make sense they might have machines because yeah, but they I, didn't have people. Yeah, but I'm I'm curious right now about, like, the real world. Because the, the reason science fiction is an important genre is because it allows you to look at your own world in a different way. And that's, like, you know, important. Um, so what I want to say is I, is that really what science fiction is for? I didn't know that. Well, in my opinion, that's no, I'm not saying that's what it's for. I'm saying that is why I'll die on this hill. I don't care. I think science fiction is the most important genre of literature because of that. 
because it allows you to, to remove yourself from the situation because the situation is not yours. It's alien. You know, anything that happens on Earth, we as humans have preconceived notions and opinions on things that happen on Earth. Mm -hmm. So you cannot approach any situation without bias. You can approach a situation without bias if it takes place on another planet. But if then that thing represents your real world, then when you're, you know, reading the novel, you go, wait a minute, this is just like my world. These people are being treated like shit. But in my world, I don't think they're being treated like shit. So maybe I need to reconsider. You follow me? Mm-hmm. Okay. But but another reason I want to bring up this quote is because he says, if any, okay, if you have a quote, right, that's any teacher who can be replaced by a machine should be, no, one, you, no one's just going to say that. I would assume that must have been a response to the conversation of the day. Right. So I would assume at some point, you know, people were like, maybe we don't need teachers anymore when computers were coming about. Mm-hmm. I don't at the moment know when he said that. Or what the context was. Right. But I think it's a really good quote. I like it. Because it flips it on its head, you know? It's almost like, remember you read Educated, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. One of my favorite parts of Educated, because you're not supposed to sympathize with her parents, you know, because mm-hmm. they're kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. But one thing the dad says that makes sense and flips everything on its head. It's almost, it's a complete perspective switch. Is the little girl, the main character, goes to her grandparents' house, the the, the more normal, I guess you would say, grandparents, mm-hmm. and she goes to the bathroom and she doesn't wash her hands. And the grandfather's like, what are you doing? You got to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom. And so then when the dad comes to pick her up, the grandfather says to the dad, why don't you teach your kids to wash their hands after they go to the bathroom? And when the dad says, I teach my kids not to piss on their hands. So... It's like it's it's like that reversal. It's a complete perspective switch. It's like I don't need to teach you how to clean up messes if you don't make messes. It's an interesting concept. Mm-hmm. So I think I don't know. I I think I apply it to here. Any teacher who can re- be replaced by a machine should be. So it, I just love it. It's like yeah, you, any but any anything that can be replaced by a machine should be true. But I guess what I'm saying here is in the, what he's saying here, he's not saying replace teachers with machines. He's saying replace bad teachers, teachers with good teachers. Yeah. That's what with it is. Something. Yeah. Yeah. And I I like that. I I you know. Um Well, I didn't I it that whole thing with the teaching machines. I think when I read it in there cuz I think he talks about it a few times. Right. I remember, you know, I remember thinking like, what do they mean by teaching machines? And then I went, it doesn't matter, so keep reading. I <laughs> okay. I just thought it was a I thought it was um a question of because they were on an island and Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean if you yeah. were on an island and you had Wi Fi, maybe you could be taught by your computer True. now. Yeah. Or whatever. But anyway. Yeah. Um let me see. So uh, maybe I'll just bring up like one other thing that I'm just because it happened while we were reading, you had you asked me about the dust around the sun, mm-hmm. and again, not not a detriment to you, but um, quickly I looked it up and it is real. Yeah, but see the here's the thing with the science fiction, right? If I were reading even a, a, a fiction story. And it talked about that. I'd probably look it up. I'd Google it. Right. But because this is science fiction. You assume it's fake. I figured he made it up. Okay. Yeah. So anyway. And that's yeah. cool that it's a real thing. Right. So it's interesting too because I think I was like you. And Heather does this too because she's just getting into Clark and sci-fi. I was like this too when I first got into sci-fi. You got to look stuff up. You have to be like, I have no idea if it's sci-fi or not. Right. But the other thing is a lot of sci-fi authors, you know, share ideas, share concepts. You know, telepathy is not trademarked. Telepathy can be in any sci-fi book. Right. So if I ever come across a concept that I've already read in a sci-fi or a Clark novel and like I'm aware of like whether it's fake or real or how real it is, you know, it just allows you to just keep going. And it's like, I already know in the sci-fi world, what that means. Right. So any concept of Clark's that he's already explored in like another novel for a, an avid reader, 
you know, you just, you're just aware. So, but interestingly enough, I don't know. Like when I got to that part, I never heard of Zodiacal Lights ever. Uh, I don't remember reading this book, so I don't remember that. I've never, I've never encountered it before. So I too had to look it up. Mm, That's cool. Yeah. But, but interestingly enough, now if he ever mentions it or anyone ever mentions it again, I'll know what it is and I'll know that it's real. Um, but anyway, Zodiac, okay, let's just tell them what they are. Because he describes that when there's no light pollution, it's um the sun, It, it he, they said like sailors call it false dawn. Right. Because it like illuminates the horizon. It makes it look like the sun's about to rise. But what it really is, it's, this, it's like cosmic dust being illuminated by the sun over the earth that that is dark. Right. So... It's pretty cool. And if you look up pictures, it looks pretty cool. Yeah, it looks really cool. Yeah. Um, I'm sure I'll never see that because of the way the world is now and where we live. Um, I actually read a really cool nonfiction book years ago about light pollution. And it was really interesting. Hmm. The guy said that there's, I might get my distances wrong, but he said that you can be in a de- in the desert somewhere in like the Midwest or the West. And you can, he said he was, he was in a place where there was no light pollution for like a hundred miles. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he was like 300 miles away from Vegas and you can see Vegas on the horizon. You can see the lights. Yeah. You're not the physical lights, but you see the glow yeah, of the, the whole city. Yeah. I thought it was so interesting. Um, and you know, what else is interesting is that in sci-fi, at least when I read it, anything's game because they can just make things up. So that's why I just went over that dusty yeah. sun thing and didn't, you know, I just asked you because you were there. Um, but if I were reading a novel... I would be like, is that really a thing? Like, it has to be a thing. Because you can't make stuff up. Right. Even though it's fiction. Right. When you really do make stuff up. So this is science fiction. But I still expect things in fiction, in stories, which is what my favorite thing to read, is a story with interesting characters. And I, I, need, I want things to be real. I don't want them to make up some thing but in sci-fi they can make up whatever they want i agree and i think i mean you know you read this because i asked you to if you read this because you wanted to you'd probably be interested in science fiction and as soon as you you glowing cosmic dust if you're a person who reads sci-fi anyway you're gonna want to know yeah you know you're gonna be like you're gonna be interested in that like because that's exactly what i did i looked it up i was like wait I, i just assumed you made it up yeah um so anyway I don't really have any more notes. Well, What's what up? did you think? So I felt like as this book went on, it got a, a little more ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Dude, the climax is the most ridiculous thing. Yeah. And what was with the enormously huge nurse? I don't know. Like, why did they make that woman? He, they talked about it several times, how enormous she was. What What was the point of that? I, I think it was just her only poorly devised character trait well it, that was that like was weird it, part of part so, of me thinks clark has spent time in that area and he's drawing from what he saw because yeah. he because the novel that came out right this is acc 09 acc 08 there's a whole section in it with a character from australia and he even gets into how he's aboriginal well that well, whole thing what's that other one not aboriginal the i don't know so, and I think I mentioned to you that this movie, I mean, this book made me think of Flipper, the okay. show Flipper. Yeah. And the song has been in my head for, um, I should try to find that song mm-hmm. and play it for the podcast. Uh, maybe I will. Yeah. It's probably copyrighted. But... Um, it's so cool. Anyway, um, so the way that, that the dolphin would take the kids around, like solving, you know, mysteries and right, saving right. people and everything was they would hold on to his flipper okay the dorsal right fin mm-hmm. um so that's what i imagined in my mind even though he was on something yeah he was just, he would, was on a surfboard yeah 
and it was a, he made like a harness for the yeah for the thing yeah and every once in a while he'd fall asleep and like fall off and <laughs> yeah. then wake up but then when he got to australia and he, he immediately turned into like a championship surfer yeah with like these ama- like huge post storm yeah. waves and everyone on on the beach going no go back yeah. no don't surf and he he did it and he surfed right on and the next thing he knew he was on the yeah, sand he, he wasn't surfing he I was think... he was on his stomach are you sure pretty sure yeah i don't yeah but he... i mean I surfing cause is on your stomach what, what is that called then he was like That's... riding the waves no, cause, well, yeah but he he mentions that i think mick told him about it's called well, it's like body surfing. Body surfing. It's like boogie boarding, but well, on a surfboard. Yeah. Well, I just thought that, like, that to me just was like, oh my God. Let's Seriously? Just, I don't encourage anyone to read this book, so I'll tell you, I'll, we'll explain the ending. So basically, like, remember, like, what, then, like, even just the hurricane, it's like, do you just want to describe a hurricane? Yeah. Why is this here? Well, obviously, it's here so that someone could get sick. Right. But the idea, so at the end of the book, basically, pretty much nothing happens in this book other than the kid. You know what this kid is, Ma? He's a Mary Sue. Do you know what a Mary Sue is? No. A Mary Sue is a character who never fails, doesn't do anything wrong, and ends up triumphing by the end. He, he's he, Johnny never faces any like true challenge. Mm-mm. He's given everything, and that's no one wants to read that. Right. So, um, Johnny. Just goes from little scrawny Johnny to properly tanned and a little bigger, a little musclier, a little more intelligent, more self aware. An, un- an un- unwanted kid, kid with no value to somebody who a complete stranger goes out on a limb to to keep him on the island. Right. Well, okay. I I will admit I do like that in the beginning how he explains like, look, you experience something like we're studying dolphins and and human interaction with dolphin you experience something that we've not we don't know anything about it yet we haven't studied this yet why would they help you right so the kid does kind of have he has something that no one else has it's obviously not that important yeah but don't you think that the dolphins would have just saved anybody who they found off the yes wasn't him Necessarily. I mean, that's the thing, too, man. Things happen in this novel, and then they're never like explained. I know. Like, yeah. Like, what did they? T- why did they? Did they take him? I think the idea is that they save the boy, bring him to Dolphin Island, so that these people on Dolphin Island that they know are interacting with dolphins, so that they can get the ball rolling on this whole humans help us kill every orca that ever lived. <laughs> so, yeah. Um. Yeah, the dolphins need a sponsor in their war against their cousins. It's so dumb. Yeah. Um, so, but wait, there's something else. So you were t- you were talking about how the book ends, and you were yeah. saying how there was a hurricane. Yeah. So as a yeah. So basically, Johnny just and the one other thing we didn't really mention is that Johnny is given this thing on his wrist that has buttons on it that are simple. It's like commands. an Apple Watch. Yeah, I think it's a little bigger though. Yeah. But like, um. So that allows them to just tell the dolphins, you know, there's like up, down, help, safe, like st- Left, normal, right. yeah, normal yeah. communication words. So that like re- like nothing else happens leading up to the hurricane. Uh, he goes out on the reef a couple times. I mean, if you're interested in marine biology, then these sections will be interesting. If you're not, if you came for a novel, a story about characters, you won't be interested. Um, so then a hurricane happens, and hurricane just destroys everything like everything on the island all the boats all the communication equipment and all the medicine so the professor professor kazan kazan whatever it is uh he is very sick he has pneumonia so he's gonna die so because there's no medicine so and there's no boats so the only option i mean it's kind of cool that he does it under the cover of night you know so what he does is he he gets two harnesses, one for Susie and one for Sputnik, who is Susie's son, uh, and attaches them to a surfboard who that he rides. And he determines that it's going to take, what, like 12 hours? It's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's 100 miles away. 
the Australian coast. All he needs to do, the only, if they had a cell phone and they could just call the mainland, they'd be like, someone's dying here, send a, send a plane or a helicopter. So, but he, he can't do that. So he just needs to get to Australia, say, hey, Dolphin Island, someone dying, send medicine. It's very simple. So that's the whole climax. It's I don't even know. It's like the last like 30 pages or something. I mean, it's kind of interesting because he's like on a journey and he's making progress. You know? I just see him flying through the water holding onto the dorsal fin while the music is playing from the show. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that would probably be more exciting. And then that little, the little tussle with the, the whale, the... The orca? He knew from... Yeah, from the Yeah, so so yeah, so he what encounters was his name? Snowy? Oh god, yes. Dude, Clark gives <laughs> the worst names it's... to animals. The first okay, in this whole in the second novel we meet our first ever alien in a Clark book, and they name it Squeak. That's the name. Wow. Like a, with a capital S. But anyway. Um Yeah, I was surprised at Snowy. I kept thinking he should work at the SPCA, like when, when people name like a black cat with one white spot, yeah. snowy. Yeah. yeah. So, again, it, it it's it's like hard to describe because it's hard to even explain what is normal in this novel because it's not normal in real life that killer whales are like the enemy of everyone. Yeah. I don't even know why, but I mean, there's got to be a reason it got that name, killer whale. But anyway, um, so then a killer whale comes to him on his little surfboard and killer whales are the enemies of dolphins d- d- the dolphins leave I'm pretty sure they leave that's why he's alone with the orcas yeah so then these two orcas show up a female and a male and the male's much larger oh yeah yeah that's and right. the idea is that the, the female like protects him so okay let me tell you how this book would be better if the sentiment that killer whales or that orcas need to be exterminated is gone because the killer, because let's say like the kid, if the kid couldn't get there under the power of the dolphins. But wait. What? They weren't going to get rid of them all. They were just going to teach them to stay away from dolphins. Right? Yeah, but I think there's discussion in the book that a lot of people don't think that that is possible. Yeah. You got to think of something. You have to think of something. Yeah, that's true. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. But, um, so what would have made this novel good is if the kid realized that he, that under the power of the dolphins, he won't get there in time. And so the orca comes and because the orca is bigger and faster and stronger, he gets there and everyone realizes that, oh, you know what? Dolphins and orcas like can get along and like maybe it's like a misunderstanding or something like some kind of realization that things are different but they're still beneficial you know like Mm -hmm. you you get what i'm saying like i'm probably not saying it properly no i know what you mean but if there was that reversal where it was like where he finally got to the doctor and the doctor was like oh like did any pesky whales bother you and the kid would be like actually the whale is the reason you're alive so let's rethink this whole killer whales of the enemy thing and let's figure something else out i mean even that is stupid but (laughs) It's better than the whale just like goes around him and he realizes that, oh, maybe I don't even know what he realizes that one of the whales protects him simply because they had a relationship from before or because of Mick. Yeah, that's I didn't forget. Like, yeah. What kind of lesson is that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't. So the whales leave him alone um, and then the dolphins come back and the dolphins bring him the rest of the way to Australia. And then the final climax, climax is, yeah, he's out at sea. It says about a thousand feet from the shore. And between him and the shore is the ridiculously rough and very dangerous crashing surf. And so... That even like the best surfers in Australia won't go near. Yeah, he says that. He goes, the best surfers, the best surfers and swimmers live in Australia. And and so when I looked up there, I saw that all the surfboards were stuck on the ground and no one was out in the water. So that must mean that this is even dangerous. It was dangerous. really bad. Yeah, it's yeah. even bad for the people who do this all the time. Right. And yet, and I kind of thought it was cool how, remember he said like the people were waving him in because they could see because they know which waves are going to be the most dangerous. Mm-hmm. So they're like waving him in. I liked how he like lost his nerve and then he had to wait. I mean, I did kind of like that ending, like the feeling you got from all these people like gathering together to be like, 
why is there a kid like a thousand feet away? Yeah. You know? Um, and then he comes in and then, you know, the next chapter he's back on the Island talking to the, talking to the professor who's perfectly yeah. fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the novel. So, I mean, I never, I didn't, I don't, I didn't think this was good the first time I read it. You know, I don't suggest it really. I think we should definitely get a kid to read it. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know any kids. So, yeah. Like if I had like think about a it. young cousin, I could, you know, do an episode or whatever, but I actually, but I like that idea. I would love to do like a bonus, like a follow up. Like a short episode of just like what did the target audience even though it's really not the target audience the target audience would be yeah. a fifteen year old in nineteen sixty two. But anyway. Okay, so most episodes do you have anything else you want to say about Dolphin Island by Arthur C. Clark? No. I'm okay. good. All right. And before we get into our second work by ACC, we need to thank our sponsors. Interested in marine biology? Are you able to hold your breath for abnormally long periods of time? Always wanted to learn another language? Well, join Professor Kazan's People of the Sea Dolphin Integration Camp. We are accepting applications from children under the age of 14 because of their small size and eagerness to learn about the creatures of the sea. Dolphins prefer small human liaisons, and we know parents prefer small summer camp prices. So we are offering a great deal for the summer of 2055. Eight weeks on Dolphin Island for a meager $10,000 per child. Transportation from anywhere in the world provided by Trans-Pacific Hoverships. Usually, uh, as my listeners probably know, we often discover uh, discuss um, a movie, mm-hmm. but we didn't watch a movie. I was gonna have you read a Michael Cri- uh, Michael Cunningham novella. Remember? I don't know why that didn't happen. Yeah, why didn't that happen? Because it's like long and it's a lot longer. Oh yeah, it's like a hundred pages, so I didn't know if we'd have time. I probably would have liked that though. It's really good. Yeah, it's not science fiction. No, no, it is. That's why I was going to have you read it. Michael Cunningham writes science fiction? You betcha. So in that book, it's... No, no, no. It's three, it's three novellas. <clears throat> and just one of them happens to be sci-fi. And it's, and it's sci-fi only because one of the characters is an alien. Other than that, like everything they talk about and everything they do is like not pretty much normal Earth stuff. I think she's like trying to escape genocide. Like, I think she's like an alien. I can't mm-hmm. really remember. And she's like treated like shit. And so a human helps her. Which that could happen here. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, that's a great book. You should read it. Anyone at home. It's called Specimen Days. Uh, so what we did do is we read Dog Star, which is a short story by Clark. And my mo- mother my mother is an animal lover, worked at the SPCA her whole life. We have dogs. We have cats. And when I read Dog Star, it's like only a person who owns a dog could write that right what do you think about it um i liked it i like the title but didn't have a different title at one point i don't know i thought i would I, why would i have made that up well in that book there is there are little um blurbs before each story maybe it says it there Um. Oh yeah, P- first published as Moon Dog. Ooh. Yeah. So, Dog Star. I automatically like the title because it has dog and star in it, both of which I like. But did you, I don't know if you even know this, but Emma, the most recent dog that we had besides Penny, Emma. Um, her name was Star. Really? When we got her. Okay. Yeah. And I couldn't. So her name was Emma Starr, but we never called her that. Her whole name was Emma Starr? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> um. So anyway, I just, I automatically liked it because of that. Moondog okay. just sounds like Moondoggy from like the 19th. 
fifties, like Greece. Okay. And stuff. But anyway. Well, that's when Clark was writing these stories. Oh, that would make that makes sense. Um. So yeah, I liked it. It was sad. I mean, I thought it was really sad. Yeah, but I mean, so just compare the quality of writing. Uh, yeah. So okay, so here's the thing. I think Arthur C. Clarke is he's one of my favorite authors of all time. I certainly think that an author I love, you know, non sci you know, I like the standard classic contemporary classic stuff. Jam Kutsia, Michael Cunningham, Yukio Mishima, like like uh, you know, like smart people stuff. Yeah. Whatever. But I love Arthur C. Clarke. I'm saying those guys are obviously better writers, but like Arthur C. Clarke has the ability to write about space and sci-fi and things in such an amazing like poetic and just just this gorgeous he's he's like a poet like mm-hmm. he's a poet and an engineer someone called him and that was more evident in this story than this so and that's what i'm saying so i i just couldn't let you only read dolphin yeah. island because it's just not a good representation of how good of a writer clark is right so what do you think just t- talk about like because you've you're a, you've read more books than i have obviously like as a writer, what do you think about Dogstar? Um, I don't quite know what to say. I mean, I I love the way he described the dog, and you know the way he felt about leaving her or him. Tell the t- tell us about the plot. Um, well, I mean, it's about. I feel like I should have written a book report. Um, it's about a guy who finds a dog and he becomes very close to the dog and the dog goes everywhere, everywhere with him and does everything with him and is extremely loyal. And then, um, you know, he had the ever left her, and then he had to go to some place, but I don't remember where. Um, what in the? Well, he's still on Earth, right? Yeah, but doesn't he? He's in California. Yeah, but doesn't he go to another planet? Yeah, but that's later. You got to get to the first, the first uh, thing that the dog does. For oh, him. so when the dog? Wait, is the first thing the earthquake? Yeah. Yeah. So the dog wakes him up. Oh no, he was at at the friend's house. Mm-hmm. Right. Foot? No. Um, so he, yeah, he was at a friend's house, and the dog woke him up. Oh, and the people didn't really want him there; didn't want the dog there. And but he brought him anyway. And the dog woke him up, and he ran outside, and there was a huge earthquake, and everything got ruined, and the people that didn't want the dog there died. Right, and it's important to say there that um, the dog was freaking out before the earthquake happened. And right. That's what drew him out of the house to then be safe from the earthquake. Right. So the dog saved his life. Yes. And it was a dog, also important to note, it was a dog that in the beginning, when he first found it, he says like he doesn't like dogs. Right. So then he adopts this dog that he basically found on the side of the street. Yes. And, you know, like you said, learns to love him. Right. And then he saves his life from an earthquake, and then... Then what happens? Then he goes away, goes, where did he go? To the moon? Yes. Yeah, so he goes to the moon, and he he waits until the very end to make any plans for what he's going to do with him while he's gone, because he obviously doesn't want to leave him. But he ends up leaving him with an old man and his wife. And um, anyway, he took one more walk with the dog and went away. And then he found out a month later that she had, she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she? Laika. Remember he calls her a bitch. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, she, okay. Um, And he couldn't, he was really, he felt really guilty about it. Like he was just as bad as the people who abandoned her in the first place on the side of the road where he found her. Um, but anyway, I guess he had to go because of work. And well, he explains that 
it's the next logical step going to the moon. Like it's this career that he's this career path that he's been on since right. he's like left college or whatever. Right. And it's like, this is just where I've always been aiming at. Right. And that, but all of a sudden there's this dog. Right. The thing I, one thing I didn't think, um, I thought it was interesting when he says um, that it was a long time before dogs could go as pets or animals could go as pets and how expensive it would be to keep them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the moon or wherever. Yeah. So, because Well, because everything in space, need, you can't, it needs to be brought from Earth. Right. It takes up, it takes up weight and space right. and all that. Right. So, um, anyway... She completely loses interest in living and um, and dies about a month. No, I don't know how soon. Very recently after he leaves. Yeah. Yes. So he didn't find it until a month later that she had died. Um, there was no reason. She just lost interest in living. So he's woken up by the sound of frantic barking, and he once again... Um, is this escapes from something bad happening. And you do you know what happened? Do you not know what happened at the end of the story? Well, he doesn't The dog saves him twice from yeah, an earthquake and then a moonquake. Yeah. Isn't that just amazing? Man's best friend, dude. Ah, uh, yeah. And it just seems like the kind of thing that that you could easily tell that story not on the moon. And pe- I feel like people would be like, you know, I had a similar experience. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, definitely. I have a connection with my dog. You know what I mean? Right. And he said, so was this a real dog? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. Because he says at the beginning, she's buried in the garden or something. I can no longer bear to read the story now that Laika sleeps forever in the garden of the home we once shared. Mm-hmm. So that's his real dog? Yeah. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. I agree. Um, actually, before we, so this is this and this. This story is extremely well written, and I think that's why I was sort of stumbling over telling the story because this entire story could be told in like a page and a half. Yeah, but it's filled with so much description and just the way things are written that it's. Almost like the story is lost in the in the telling. Okay, but not really. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it's a great story. Yeah, it's. I feel like it's one of those stories too where I felt as it was going, like it got to a point where it was like at any point this could end and it would be really good. Mm-hmm. But then it kept going and yeah. it kept getting better. Like you don't right. even need the moon quake thing. Right. To me that's the best part of the story having mm-hmm. read the whole thing now, but as you're reading you're like it's it's already sad and relatable that the dog died when you left. Right. But then he just goes on to like really pull at the heartstrings. Right. Um I would suggest dog star to anyone whether you like sci-fi or not. Do you agree? Yeah, and especially if you like dogs. Right, right. Um and I want to talk And it's not really but it's not really sci-fi. I mean he goes to the moon. Well, people go to the moon. The only thing that's, that's well, no, 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 no. He says specifically. He says precisely how much it would cost just for the dog food to be. So that means that it takes place in a world where costs and space are calculable, calculatable. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's a that's a civilization that has taken to the stars. Yeah, which is not what we are. We've we've taken to very low orbit Earth, right, and polluted the shit out of it, right. Um. And the and the fact that he hears the dog on the moon is I don't know if that's what is that called? It's not science fiction because he doesn't um, really hear the dog. No, um, I think all that's supposed to say Maybe is he's dreaming of the yeah, dog. Exactly. I think what it's I think what it's supposed to say is that the bond was so strong. You know, like on the one hand, right here, I'll explain. This is I think I got it. Okay. On the one hand, you could have this story take place entirely on Earth, right? And he goes, he doesn't even have to leave. Mm-hmm. He just, like, 
the dog dies. And it say, the bond between man and beast was so strong that it transcended death. But if you're a sci-fi writer and you're Arthur C. Clarke and you're a cheeky SOB, Mm -hmm. you'd be like, okay, I'll, I'll up that even more. The bond between man and beast was so strong that it, that it, it, it traveled the gulf of space between earth and moon to save its master. That's even more amazing, you know? Do you think he should have stayed? Yes. But I also think that it may not have been about going to the moon. It may have been about uh, death. Okay. Like, he could have gone to the moon, dog died, come back. And been saved by something. I agree. So yeah. it had more to, 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 for me, it had more to do with the fact that the dog died than that he was on the moon. I agree. No, I agree totally. Yeah. But I think what, what we're getting caught up in, and people get caught up in this all the time when they talk about sci fi, is. Um, well, if he saw the dog and patted the dog, and and after no. the moon, the moon cano. No, not volcano. What was it? Moonquake. Moonquake. Mm-hmm. Um, that that like if he had like dog drool on his shirt or something, that. Yeah. That okay. I get what you're saying. That would be like. But okay. Let me just. Let me just. Okay. Yeah. If you like, let's say I don't think an author sets out to say maybe they do. Uh, Stephen King. I don't think Stephen King set out to say, I'm going to write horror novels. It's just what he wanted to write. Arthur C. Clarke's not going to write a novel. Like he w- he wanted to live on the moon. Mm-hmm. He's not going to write a novel and not include science fiction and space. That's the thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and dude, sci-fi is such a massively wide and huge umbrella. It houses so many things. You know. Mm-hmm. So, so. To even just say Arthur C. Clarke, science fiction. No, dude. Because robots are sci-fi. Clarke doesn't ever have robots. You know what I mean? Uh, it's just he's space science fiction because that's what he was into. Mm-hmm. So he's just going to write what he's into. And if he was inspired by his dog, he's not just going to write a story on Earth. Right. He's going to do it in space. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's, it's cool because that the the bond between man between humans and their dogs is not something you expect to read about in sci-fi but if you can get that message across to a sci-fi reader mm-hmm. it's still a good message you know right. it's still a good story yeah so that sci-fi reader i think will appreciate it right i don't go looking for you know animal stories but i love that story mm-hmm. it's ridiculously good yeah it is good um and it's really well written I agree. And I love hearing you say that. Yeah. And this here, it's not so much. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Can't believe he named him Johnny. <laughs> Dude, his the names are, yeah, he doesn't. Clark does not exceed well at writing about people and like their relationships and, you know, they're usually very one note. Mm-hmm. It's entertaining, but it's usually just, you know, clearly this character is this way, and that's the way they're going to be the whole book. Right. But I do want to read one more section because part of what we do in this podcast is determine who in the novels are space dreamers. Mm -hmm. Usually that's everyone. Sometimes it's everyone. Sometimes it's easy to pick out one or two. Obviously, this doesn't take place in space, but Johnny is 100% a space dreamer, and it's because of this paragraph. It did not take him long to make up his mind. Ten minutes later, hurriedly dressed in his warmest clothes, he was quietly unbolting the back door. As he stepped out into the freezing night, he never dreamed that he was leaving the house for the last time. And even if he had known, he would not have been sorry. So that is when he hears the hover ship break down. Yep. And he's thinking, I could go explore or I could stay here where I should stay. 
Right. But because, you know, you learn that he doesn't like his home life and he is, as I am claiming, a space dreamer, he's going to leave. Right. And he's not going to look back. Right. Because it says he doesn't, he, he didn't know if he was leaving for the last time, but it doesn't matter. Right. Even if he did, he would still leave. That's a space dreamer. Obviously, he's not going to space, but it's the unknown. Really like an unknown dreamer. Do you think if he had like a happy family life, he still would have left? Or would he have like woken up his dad and said, hey, what's that noise? I don't know what would have happened, but thinking about that, I imagine a better novel coming out of it, (laughs) which is, I don't know what that says. But, okay, do you have any final thoughts on Clark or this podcast or anything? Um... Well, I don't think I'm going to read any more Arthur C. Clarke novels because I have a million other novels yeah. and books that I want to read and I'm getting old, so not that much time. Mm-hmm. And But it I, it's fine and I appreciate you giving me a kind of easy one. Yeah. And then a story that was very interesting... And, um, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, I, I wanted to get you on the show. So, cause I know you're, I know you don't like sci-fi, but you're like a huge reader. Mm-hmm. Probably the reason I'm a reader. I like to read. So, yeah. So, I mean, I had to get you involved somehow. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. So let me think here. I think. So um, why, why didn't you make me wa- read a, I mean, watch a movie? I didn't think you'd want to. Oh. Well, if you had, what movie would you have? Do the, do the Probably movies? Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh. Why do you like that if you don't like sci-fi? I don't really like, because it's funny. Okay. And I remember, I have a very distinct memory of going to see it. Richard Dreyfuss. Yeah. Always, always a good time. Yeah, that's true. And and a pile of sand in your living room. That's Can't so, go wrong. Yeah, right? Yeah. He's so crazy in that movie. And there and the music in that movie is great. True. It was one of the first dates. First I think it might be the first time Dad and I went to a movie together. Really? Yeah. Wow. And I I can even remember the um weather. It was really nice weather. And we were in Dad's truck. And I remember rolling down the window and saying it's really nice out. And dad said, then why don't you leave it out? <laughs> it's like an old joke. It's really nice out. Yeah. So I think I'll leave it out or something like that. I don't get it. <sighs> well, never mind. Then. Anyway. I think that movie came out in 71. So I'm just trying to imagine dad. No, it didn't come out. What? In the 80s? Close Encounters? The end of the 70s? Well, I, the the point I'm getting at is I, I'm wondering whether it came before or after Star Wars. Well, Because those it, are two very different kinds of science fiction. Yeah. And I've never seen Star Wars and okay. have no intention. Oh, 77, dude. The same year. Yeah, it was wow. when... Wow. I, I moved to New Hampshire. I met Dad in 1977. Really? Yeah. So it was like one of our first dates. Yeah. Um, wait, and I, I want to figure this out. And we out. went like um, to a movie theater, I want to say in like Massachusetts or something. But anyway, I like, you know, I liked it. It was entertaining. It was funny. Isn't it funny? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great movie. I mean, it's a Steven Spielberg movie. It's everything you get yeah. from Steven Spielberg. Wait. Oh, Okay. So that that's very interesting. I mean, maybe you don't care, but so the world was introduced to Star Wars May fourth, nineteen seventy seven, and now it's what we all know that it is. Right. Um, Close Encounters came out in November, so the whole world was coming off that sci fi Star Wars high, and then you get this completely different kind of sci fi. It's to the point where I'm amazed. I mean, obviously it's a great movie. I'm amazed that people remember. And Close Encounters so well, having come out the same year as this thing that just completely changed science fiction. Right. It's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. But, 
I would watch Close Encounters of the Third Kind 10 times in a row before watching any Star Wars, personally. I've never watched anything to do with Star Wars, and I probably never will. So in my mind, I'm just imagining, I'm sure Dad was disappointed by Close Encounters because he had just seen Star Wars. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying. All these people who love Star Wars, after Star Wars, man, like, what can you do? Yeah. Can't reach that. I don't remember whether he liked it, and I don't, I mean, I don't remember hating it, myself hating it, but I also don't remember being like, oh, my God, that movie was so awesome. Yeah. But I I liked it. Yeah, I like it. Um, Well, even though we didn't watch it, we talked about it. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Do you have a favorite science fiction movie? I probably do, but I, I'd have to think about it. I, I'm and, not good at and there's so many different answering kinds of things. Sci- what well, don't you like the, the fly? Top. That's like sci-fi horror. Yeah, I mean I don't love it, but it was interesting. Yeah. Um, Jeff Bloom is funny. Yeah. Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum. Jeff, Jeff Goldblum. Bloom. <laughs> <laughs> um, We're friends. So I just shorten his. Yeah. Name. Wait. What's the Jurassic Park sci-fi? But really, it's like an adventure movie. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I liked, um, what's that one, Forever Young? Yeah. Is that about yeah. the guy that... Mel Gibson is frozen yeah. and then wakes up. Yeah. That was a good one. I agree. That was good. And then there was another one that just popped in my mind. Oh, Starman? Oh, that's a great movie. Yeah. John Carpenter, I think. I think. And who who's the... Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I kind of like those. Yeah, what about, have you seen The Matrix? Yeah, two, like. Weird. No, not weird, like. Action. Yeah, maybe too much action. Wait, okay, let's end it on this. I remember that, like, everyone in our family went and saw Independence Day 2, and you were with them. Me? Yes. And in my mind, I remember when that movie came out, I was, in my mind, I was like, I love sci-fi and that movie looks like garbage. Why would my mother? (laughs) Are you sure I went? Dude, you went. And I remember thinking like, I didn't go, but mom went? I don't remember. I barely remember the first one. Isn't it? Will Smith? Yes. That, well, the second one, he's the only one not in the second one because he was smart enough to avoid it. It's apparently garbage. And so the, the, the I guess the point I was trying to make, and if you don't remember, that's fine. But my, the point I was going to make is as a person who doesn't like sci-fi, what's it like watching a bad sci-fi movie? Like, I can't even imagine. Or maybe you, maybe you watch you think, this is what all sci-fi is like. Is Spaceballs um, a sci-fi movie? Yeah, sci-fi spoof. <laughs> I like that. Space the sci fi in space falls space balls is like better, honestly, than a lot of sci fi movies. Now, if I did go see Independence Two or One or it was probably remember. because no, I don't remember. And it was probably like somebody said, Oh, let's go to a movie and I was like, Yeah, you guys pick and then when they picked I was like, Oh god You know, maybe I vaguely I remember like maybe you guys went and it was sold out. So that so instead you saw Oh, <laughs> And it's day two. Ay, ay, ay. Hey, I don't even like the first one. Yeah. Um, but anyway, well, thank you for doing this and reading, You're welcome. reading that book. Um, I remember when we first started doing this and I mentioned like to Amy or something, I was like, you know, if I commit, we're going to have to do Dolphin Island. And I think Amy flat out was like, no not doing it i think that's why i recruited you you're like let's get mom (laughs) she'll do anything like i said i wanted you on here i figured this would be the no it was a good choice yeah yeah. it was short yeah okay so next episode is gonna be and this is what i was looking up earlier i can't i just have to i just want to tell people okay the next episode is going to be about Mm -hmm. glide path glide path this is interesting. Clyde Path is the only Clark novel that is not science fiction. It takes place during World War II. Oh, God. But he's he was in World War II. Yeah. So it's, you know, based on his experiences uh, building, like, a specific kind of radar, sonar thing 
it's it's very interesting in the book. I just don't remember all the details. Hmm. But there's one moment in it that I just I absolutely loved. It's it's not science fiction because it's real, but to the characters experiencing it, they're experiencing something that no one on earth has ever experienced, but it's normal now. So that that scene where they experience this thing it was so amazing. Hmm. Um, it's yeah. I mean, I feel like I shouldn't give it away. Oh, I'll listen to the podcast. Wait, yeah. you're not going to make me read it. No, I'm going to oh. make Amy read it. So I'll just tell Amy not to listen. I'm going to tell you what it is. Cause it's so cool. Listen, cause you might understand why it's cool. So <laughs> what they're developing, I'll give you the quick version. They're developing a thing that will allow airplanes to land at night or in bad weather where there's where the pilot literally can't see anything. And so the way they do that is they have this um sonar thing that they're 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 able to from the ground talk the plane down at night. Because like it's World War II where like if you're going to go on a bombing run it's at night. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um and it's England where it's very foggy, rainy because he's British. Clark is British. He was in the RAF. So they're they're developing this technology and they get a one in the middle of the night they're all just like engineers they're not like soldiers they're engineers they get this call they're like hey does your talk down thing work because we got a plane that like you're the only place that it can reach and they're like yeah we can help you so just come and so so they talk this plane down and it's very stormy that's i think that's why they have to emergency land very stormy and they hear this horrifying scream right a scream of engines right and it and so they're in their little building so they hear that scream so they come out and the runways you know that way and out of the gloom ma comes a jet propelled aircraft so no lights i think it was like foggy so they couldn't see oh. it's foggy and rainy and stormy so they probably saw the lights beyond the fog, but then it emerges out of the fog and they are met with the first like jet engine propelling an airplane. That's normal. We've uh, like, uh, you know, we ride on them now. Mm-hmm. It's totally normal. But imagine. Right. And the thing that the thing that blows them away in the situation is the sound that it makes. Because think about it. The propeller, that's all you hear, you know, like the the spinning and the engine but a jet, imagine hearing a jet engine right up close for the first time and you didn't know what it was. Yeah, crazy. Like, even though it's not science fiction, it's the same sense of awe. Mm-hmm. A, sen- a sense of awe when met with the unknown. That scene blew me away. The rest of the novel is, you know, basically not as bad as this, but it's put you to sleep type stuff. But <laughs> that moment, whew, never forget it. Cool. I can't wait for Amy to read it. And Have they made a movie out of it? Nah. Oh. Clark, uh, there's Clark has a lot of books that would make amazing movies, and yet I think Kubrick just ruined it for everyone else. You know, mm-hmm. it's like don't even try. Yeah, which is too bad because not all sci-fi needs to be like that. Hmm. Um, but anyway, the next episode is Glide Path, so please tune into that. It's going to be cool. It'll be interesting to hear Amy have to read a, a non-sci-fi Clark novel. Um, follow me on instagram at the space streamers um yeah you want to sign us off how do i do that however you want how do they sign you off on npr i don't know don't they i don't remember what they say all i know is npr is that nasty bass line that they play it's nasty yeah okay um well, one thing they do on NPR all the time is that they, they're they kind of awkward at the end, I feel like, of interviews. Okay. So you would say to me, thank you very much for joining me today, Mom. So you say that. Thank you very much for joining me today, Mom. You're welcome. It was my pleasure to join you today. Well, thank you. You're welcome. For doing thank it. you. Yes. Yeah. So it's just okay. back and forth. But yeah. And then okay. you're like, oh, God, end it already. All right. So, yeah, we're good. That's the perfect ending right there. Awesome. (laughs) 
Hello, space dreamers. Thanks for joining me today. What a weird episode about a weird book. Thank you to my co-host, the mother of all sci-fi lovers, for joining me today and listening to my mad ravings about science fiction and Arthur C. Clarke in general. Big shout out to Amy for performing my ads this time around. Thanks to Kevin LeSage for making all the music that you hear in this podcast. And last but not least, I gotta thank Quinlan Aikens for that buttery smooth voice when he does all the readings from the novels. Join us next week for a discussion about Glide Path, Clark's only non-sci-fi novel. Also, after Glide Path comes the mother of all sci-fi novels. We are talking about 2001, A Space Odyssey, and we have four total hosts. Everyone read it, and why not? It's a 10 out of 10. Okay, join us next week, and thanks for joining us this week. Over and out. This has been a Sumadre production. Thank you for joining us.